Welcome back to the Capital Mindset Show, everyone. Hope you guys are having a great day. As always, today we're going to be entertaining the idea, is Buffett predicting a stock market crash? All right, so I saw the video by Sven Carlin that we're going to be reacting to, sent by my followers, and I know that Strongman also reacted to it, so we're going to give our fair shake at it. And I wanted to first discuss, okay, so you know, we all know who Warren Buffett is. We all know the stalwart of a company that is Berkshire Hathaway, uh, but what, what does this mean? Selling for a crash or predicting a crash. Well, you guys have been looking around and seeing articles saying exactly this. Hey, Warren Buffett has dumped a lot of Apple stock recently. Should investors follow his lead? Uh, Warren Buffett has sold this. Warren Buffett has sold that. So there are a lot of theories floating around as to why he's selling, right? And people recall, hey, he also sold a lot back when valuations were crazy. And you know what happened after 2008? So people are trying to draw parallels between now and back then. And okay, let's let's kind of explore that idea. I'll share my thoughts personally. What I think at the end of the video, um, as far as like if I do believe Warren Buffett is breaking this, but let's go ahead and and look at what Sven Carlin had to say, so we can hear it from his own mouth, and then we can talk about what his points are as, as he did before the 2007 2009 financial crisis this is indicative of something he says he can predict markets but he did it well here and he's doing it again here the news is that so one also thing that you should know is that Buffett often touts that you know timing the market is not a fruitful endeavor. There have been other super investors who've stated the same thing. They're often referring to, of course, what the average person should be doing. The average person should not be attempting to time the market whatsoever. But oftentimes people in, in their position may in fact do things that they advise other people not to do. For example, Warren Buffett also tells people to just invest in the SP 500, yet he himself has not done so. Because of course he himself believes that his capital in his hands is better suited, better allocated according to his decisions and needs and or that of his team. So let's also kind of go over, well, there's, there's one little nuance here, but yeah, yes, uh, there, there is a lot of selling and they have $132 billion um, more in sales than they purchase stocks. So it, it's a big number. Also, Berkshire Hathaway is the biggest it's ever been uh, in terms of its portfolio size. So all these things are true. At over the last two years, Berkshire has sold $132 billion more in stocks than they we'll have over this purchased. And Warren Buffett page. says that market timing is both impossible and stupid, oh, there, the but yep, that's true. okay, he might not be timing right. the market, we'll skip but to this foremost other. perspective I want to give you is the current S&P 500 price to earnings ratio that has spiked up in exuberance and it is 30 compared to half of the historic. Okay, so this point kind of annoys me. <laughs> But um, we'll, we'll we'll address it. So uh, the reason why I think this point is almost like the very definition of noise, and let's define noise before we proceed. Uh, we'll define noise as things that are factually true, factually true and irre irrefutably true, but by themselves mean absolutely nothing. All right. So I'll classify that as noise. You go on the news a lot. You, you read the news and then you see a lot of facts, right? Th these are true statements, but by themselves, they mean nothing. And then in the world of investing, we are trying to filter out noise. We're trying to make sure that we do not allow noise to affect our valuations or decision making, et cetera. This is perfect example. There's another one that I might do a video on, on uh, a tweet that was sent to me um, and wanting to, me to react to it within the Capital Mindset Club. And I, I'll probably do a video on it as well. I might even tweet about it. But um, this is also a great example. Uh, thank goodness he actually brought this up. So let's, let's address my counterpoint to this um, and kind of explain hopefully why, in my opinion, this is absolute noise. Well, well, yes, a P.E. ratio is absolutely a traditional form of valuation, a metric that we can use as a barometer for if a stock is expensive. Although by itself, the P.E. ratio is not the full story. We cannot justify the expensiveness or cheapness of a stock by just using the P.E. ratio. I wish it was that easy, but it's, it's just simply not. And by him saying this, I feel like it, unless he's not as intelligent, which I think he is intelligent, that's the thing. I, I just think he's just not explaining the facts fully he's not uh you know doing good by his audience but let's let's talk about for example 
um, the the one key issue that kind of negates all this, and that's constituency. I've talked about this in live streams. So what is constituency? The makeup of the S P 500 of today is completely different from that of you know 20 years ago. And, and okay, what's different? Well, back in the day, we used to have the top constituency of the S P 500 being um, mainly energy companies, banks, many other countries. Their indexes are exactly that: banks energy companies. And I talked to this on Strongman's live stream, and I'm, I was happy when I, he published his video. He also talked about this, so I'm very happy. I want to get this message out there. The PE ratio of today is not equivalent of the P ratio of back then. You would have to do some other extraordinary measure and then kind of do some different sector weightings and equalize it for what it was back then and then do, do that measure. You got to compare apples to apples, not apples and bananas, right? We all can agree on that. So a tech company that has um, uh, an unknown expansion cycle, right? We don't know how big it can get. We don't, we, they clearly have much more stable cash flows, better margins than that of an energy or bank company who are priced for that cyclicality. Um, are we going to expect that they trade at the same multiple? Probably not. I, I would argue not. Um, I would argue that Apple, it's not a discussion of if it's overvalued or not, right? Separate discussion. But Apple should not be valued the same as ExxonMobil. I think I think we can agree on that. I think we can also agree that Citigroup back in the day or, or all the other bank companies that were quite large and a huge constituency, uh, which should probably also not be valued the same way as Microsoft, Apple. We can agree on that. So then when I'm looking at the average P ratio of, I don't know, Canada, right? And then looking at, at the United States, I think we can also agree that these tech companies... <laughs> probably shouldn't be trading at the same valuation. And we're just talking about the most popular ones. I mean, you keep going down a little bit further, you'll still see plenty of other tech companies that have risen uh, in the ranks of the S&P, right? Visa, right? Visa is a pretty large company. It's pretty large in the in, in terms of the size within the S&P 500. It's, it, should that be trading at the same multiple as a mining company? Really? Are we going to make that argument? No, of course not. The answer is no. And so if you conclude that, then you also have to agree that this by itself is means nothing, right? It doesn't mean it's not overvalued, but this is just noise. This this is just noise. Twenty nine PE, okay. But we are we going to stop there? I'm I'm going to see because I haven't seen this video yet. I'm going to see if he stops and gets into it a little bit more, but I doubt it because it's only six minutes and forty seconds. Historical average. If we go back to the historical average, there is he covers plenty it? of room, and the markets also. Okay, so you drew a line, assuming it's going to go back to the average. Okay. Sometimes tend to overshoot right. on the downside in panic, and that could be a big, big issue, especially if interest rates stay higher for longer. Interest rates move in a cycle. Now there was commotion, the Fed lowered rates, then it will not, will it be as planned? That could be the game changer for also market valuations. Bonds. This okay, so the whole Fed thing, I can do a whole video on that and we can nerd out on the role of the Fed and its effect on market valuations, et cetera. And I, I think, again, there's, there's just like a whole lack of nuance. It's overly simplified. It's not if then. I wish it was like that easy that, you know, when we when we do valuations, that it's just like, oh, you know, whatever whatever the Fed does, then up oh, that, that changes everything. No, there's a lot more nuance. And even now with rates lowering down, you know, depending on what kind of sector we're talking about, it's going to have, uh, you know, different effects. Some will benefit from the short term rate dropping and the long term rate rising. Some will benefit or some will get harmed by the short term rates dropping and longer term rates uh, rising. And then some will have, you know, kind of more neutral experience with that. It's really going to be dependent at the end of the day. And what people are kind of driving the, the connection is comparability of assets, right? Risk premiums and also cost of capital as kind of a, um, you know, an input cost for businesses. So if the cost of capital rises, then of course, hurdle rates start to rise um, and the net investments start to, to, to decrease because certain projects don't pass the hurdle rates, et cetera. But we won't get into that. That's something we you know we deal with at work. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping again, we'll, we'll let the last news rethink their rates and the projections. The bond yields also went down when the Fed cut, but are now back to previous levels, saying that we might not see the cuts that 
everyone expected, which then again impacts also valuation and everything else. If we compare interest also like a half right there, you know, the FFR rate is coming down, but the longer term rate is coming up. Again, the, the longer term rate might affect, you know, let's talk in an example of things like REITs. Uh, so the 10 year is going to be more tied to REIT valuations. Um, and yeah, so kind of part rates and valuations. This is the SAP 500 ratio that has been growing for the last 40 something years. So valuations went from seven, yes, P ratio of seven to the current 30. And if we want to smoothen those ups and downs recessions, we take perfect example. What he's saying, these are facts. These are, I'm not disputing them. However, by themselves, they are useless to me as an investor because it's just noise. He's just kind of just saying facts by themselves, but that that's not something we can go off of. If he's implying we're going to get to like a seven PE and, and again, that the stock market of today is the same as the stock market of 1980. Um, I, I either, either he's not thinking clearly, um, um, or he knows, and he's just not wanting to go further with you. I don't know what's worse, right? You, you can conclude that on your own. The 10 year average earnings P ratio. And you can see here again from the 1980s has been nothing but growing in line with interest rates that have been nothing but declining since 2020 and interest. Okay. Again, these are, these are both facts that yes, interest rates, he's looking at uh, the five-year constant maturity it has gone down and he's looking at the P ratio going up. These are both facts, undisputed. Uh, however, he's drawing a correlation to causation and uh, that is a stats crime. So when you just assume um, and look at correlations and assume causation, um, as you might know or appreciate if you guys are doing your stats uh, class right now in college, some of my audience out there, if you remember your stats classes in college, um, they drilled, they were supposed to drill that into you that correlation does not equal causation. And so this is exactly that. It's that kind of uh, statistics crime where you're drawing a conclusion and looking at two correlations or, or looking at a correlation and then saying that there's a causation here. It's not necessarily. Um, again, there's there's a lot more to it than that. There's, there's, for example, the explanation of the constituency of the market. Um, because if you look at, for example, the multiples of the of banks, have, have they expanded to uh, a huge number? Have the energy companies expanded? Have their multiples, are, are they vastly different from where they were back then? That's maybe more something. Again, if you really wanted to get down to the nitty gritty, you would look at the constituency weightings um, by sector in the 1980s, and then you would readjust um, the the multiple weightings of the of the current uh, SP. I'm not going to do that for you, but but I assume you will get a different value, and then you can kind of from that gauge how much more has the market bid up the same companies, right? You do an apples to apples comparison here. You know, and I, I've been giving him some chances to correct this, but I don't think he's going to get into it. Interest rates have risen, but valuations have not gone down on the expectation that interest rates will decline and will stabilize at 2%, 2-3% for the longer term. However, if interest rates don't stabilize and we are in an upward interest rate cycle, you know what happens to valuations. Valuations go down, and that might be the key risk for investors, and also something that Warren Buffett might be watching. He says not to predict, but always look at what he does, not what he says. We have looked at food prices in this video, and if food prices go up, and food prices have not been adding to inflation, as there has been a downturn, but those did in the past, then we can immediately see higher inflation. And that's just one of the factors out there. Then we see here unemployment really good. So if you lower interest rates, you might spike up inflation. Okay. So again, a lot of facts being thrown out, but facts by themselves do not give us any useful conclusions. 
Um, and here he's going into unemployment. He was going into food about inflation. I, I'm not going to make any inflation predictions here in this video. Um, although I will say the market, the bond market is implying that there's going to be a lower run rate of inflation, um, out into the future. And, you know, depending on how you view it and what camp you fall in, um, you know, that you view it as like low growth, low inflation environment. Um, and we're getting into the complexities. I know Sven is a believer that the U S like prints money and stuff, but again, that's, that's a simplistic view or simplistic take. Um, I, I do know that Sven has published videos in the past talking about, you know, the market is overvalued. So he's been kind of saying the same thing over and over and over again. And of course we're going to have a correction at some point that that's perfectly normal. Um, so we have a lot of people on YouTube that just say, uh, you know, this is going to happen uh, every year and then, okay, eventually, yeah, you're going to be right, but you're going to miss out on, on, uh, the, on returns over that time. Um, so I think for this rest of this video, he's not talking about the points. If you guys want to go check out his full arguments, go watch his video Cash peak. and then you can come back to this video. Uh, but yes, yeah, so let's talk about why I think Buffett is selling. And I think it comes down to him preparing for the next phase of his life, which is the end of it. Uh, sad as that is to say, you know, we have to come to terms with Warren Buffett is, is very old at this point. And I don't think he wants the successors to be saddled with his his investments. As simple as put, he's he's planning for his departure. Um, so if if I was thinking or putting myself in his shoes, um, I, I would think that uh, you know Todd and Ted, who are supposed to be their own investors at this point, um, when when I go, I don't want them to feel you know pressured to not sell. I want them to just make your own decision. This is cash, deploy the cash. And so find a home for all this cash that I'm going to be, you know, leaving behind. Um, if we look at, um, the, the prior instances, there were clear signs of, uh, of distress in the markets. Um, and right now there's not really that. And, and I know we we're going to say, you know, predicting crashes and the like, but back in the, at least pre 2008, there was a lot of different, at least within the investor community. And I imagine that, um, at, at this point, one of the doomers points would be talked about quite a bit, but there was a lot of in investors talking about the the degeneracy going on in the home lending market and you heard a lot of people saying oh, homes would never you know go bankrupt or people would never foreclose on their homes it was was a common trope um but buffett assuming probably saw all of that and uh, of course he's going to be piling on cash it's not that the valuations were necessarily stretched at that time in fact that's known as the lost decade um, so it's more so a concern within the financial system. And then also he's not he's he's not oblivious to the fact that mortgages are a huge portion of the U.S. economy or housing is a huge portion of the U.S. economy. And then a lot of things are tied to it. But anyways, uh, I, I don't think he's trying to time the market here. I, I genuinely think all he's doing is clearing the, the 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 board right here. He's he's making sure that when he departs, uh, Todd and Ted are going to have a clean slate. They can figure out what they want to do. They can be their own investor. They can start their own legacies. Um, now, what would that look like? I, I don't know. I have no comment on Todd or Ted's uh, investments, but um, uh, we'll have to we'll have to just see. So, in conclusion, is Warren Buffett predicting stock market crash? I doubt it. Were the facts presented in Sven's video true? They were absolutely true. All of them individually were facts, but then putting them together and drawing conclusion from them think that that was fairly low value in my opinion. And again, Sven has predicted uh, time and time again that we're going to have some sort of correction. So eventually he will be right. Now, if you're a person investing in the index, I want you to ignore that. I want you to dollar cost average into your index fund and just know that that's, that's uh, noise, that's FUD. And the lack of nuance, and I want you to take away from this video, and you can repeat this fact to others, and I want this to spread out into the world, the constituency is different today than it was back then. So every time someone brings up the P ratio of the S&P today and the P ratio of the S&P, let's 1980, um, those are not the same thing. You need to do some extra adjustments if you really, really, really wanted to get down to the nitty gritty of comparability. But you cannot be doing that just simply by this number and that number, right? And then there's also the, the discussion to be had about the actual ways that, you know, the P ratio is calculated. 
Um, so I have a video that I made a long time ago on that, but let me know if you guys want me to remake that video. I'll be happy to walk everyone through that again. With that being said, thank you guys so much for watching and we'll be seeing you guys on the next one.